Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, a really warm welcome to the 14th annual community-based adaptation meeting. Uh, my name is Manish Bapna. I'm the uh, Executive Vice President of the World Resources Institute. And the first thing I want to do is, is one of the most important things, which is to recognize and thank the various organizations that have come together to make this conference uh, possible. Uh, starting here, just wanted to read out the names of the organizations just for a moment. Uh, the Kingdom of Bhutan, the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, IIED, uh, thank you IIED in particular for, uh, for really uh, shepherding this over, over the last 14 years. Irish Aid, the Global Resilience Partnership, the Global Commission on Adaptation, CARE, Practical Action, IUCN Netherlands, Slum Dwellers International, the Huairu Commission, the um, African Center for Trade and Development, the Environmental Management for Livelihood Improvement, Huawei's facility, Gayo, East African Youth Organization, and BRAC. Uh, so thank you all. Delighted uh, to have so many different organizations participate uh, in helping pull this together. I want to say this is the only conference dedicated to community-based adaptation, and it's really hard to imagine when this topic was more important or more timely than it is today. Just a couple of, a couple of reflections on, on both the issue of importance and the issue of timeliness before we jump into the main session. Um, I, I think we have learned that we live, uh, we have known this, but I think the world is increasingly recognizing that we live in a deeply unequal society. Um, the COVID-19 health pandemic, the economic crisis, the climate impacts all hit local communities, often, often low-income vulnerable communities, the hardest. Uh, the World Food Program estimates that 130 million more, more people will be pushed to the brink of starvation by the end of this year. The World Bank estimates that 100 million people will also likely be pushed into extreme poverty as a result of deadly climate impacts. And the vast majority of these people live on the front lines uh, in the developing world. So this point, the world is structurally unequal. Um, is something that's more apparent today than perhaps in a very long time. The second reason why this conference is so important is that we know local communities are rarely involved in responses to the health pandemic or the climate emergency. Governments, international organizations rarely put local communities at the center of policies and investment responses. Um, a recent study by Oxfam showed that between 2007 and 2013, less than 2% of humanitarian assistance went directly to local actors. IIED had recently completed a study that showed that only 10% of international climate finance goes to local communities. And we also know that civic space in so many countries around the world is closing rapidly. So the trend line is moving in the wrong direction. And yet we know that the active engagement of local communities is absolutely essential if we're going to have any type of inclusive, durable response and solutions to the COVID-19 health pandemic, the economic crisis, and the climate challenge. Why, why is this conference so timely? Because I think to some extent, the world, there's increasing momentum on adaptation, in no small part because of the work of so many of you um, at this call today. One of the areas, or one of the mechanisms whereby we have seen quite a bit more momentum on adaptation is some of the work associated with a global commission on adaptation that several of the speakers today are involved in. They have helped champion a locally led action track that is intended to really bring to the forefront the need to support community-based adaptation. And as many of you know, there will be a climate adaptation summit 
that will be hosted by the Netherlands in January, where we hope to bring some of the more important commitments around community-based adaptation to the forefront. But this conference is also so timely because this is a good moment to engage people outside of the adaptation community, outside of the climate community. Just this month, there's a very active conversation taking place in the United Nations around financing for development. Finance ministers met on September 8th. Heads of state are meeting on September 29th to talk about how to prepare, how to mobilize finance for responding to the pandemic, to the economic crisis, to the climate crisis. And that is the type of forum that this community needs to engage and influence to shape. How do we shape that the finance packages that are developed in these conversations support local communities, promote community-based adaptation? So just an incredibly important moment to be having this conversation as well. So with that, we have an incredibly exciting week. There will be five themes that this conference focuses on in particular. We're going to look at climate finance, how public and private sector finance can be transparent, can be mobilized uh, in ways that are accountable to scale up climate action while remaining inclusive, while ensuring that communities are actively engaged. We're going to look at adaptation technology, how technology can be used to both mobilize adaptation at scale at the national level, but really look at what it means at the local level. We're going to look at responsive policy. How social movements can inform policy that's ambitious and inclusive, looking at nature-based solutions, clearly critical for local communities around the world. And we're going to look at youth inclusion, how we transform our institutions so they can take advantage of young people's participation in developing locally-led adaptation. So those are themes that we're going to explore across the week. But this today, we have a terrific inaugural session with three community leaders who all have deep experience in building resilience. And they're going to offer their insights on why this conversation is so important and so timely as the world aims to confront the COVID-19 pandemic, the inequality crisis, and the climate crisis. I'm going to introduce these three community leaders in just a moment. But to start off, we're going to hear a video, gab, a video greeting from the Honorable Secretary Sonam Punso Wangdi, who is the Secretary of the National Environment Commission for the Kingdom of Bhutan and the Chair of the Least Developed Countries Group. And as many of you may know, the LDC Group has set forward their Vision 2050, which commits to ambitious, low-carbon, climate-resilient development with particular pledges to develop strong climate finance architecture with 70% of flows supporting locally led action by 2030. So let's start with the video and then I'm going to introduce the speakers we have for this inaugural session. Excellencies, distinguished participants and friends, thank you for joining us online to mark the beginning of the 14th International Conference on Community-Based Adaptation to Climate Change. Bhutan, in our capacity as chair of the LDC Group, is proud to host this year's event, and we welcome you and your participation from wherever you're connecting. While in normal times, we would have a physical meeting this year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, CBA 14 has had to innovate to bring its wider community of practice together in a new way. This way of doing things will be an experiment for all of us, but we hope that we will be able to learn from the experience together and perhaps shape new ways for us to collaborate going forward. Despite the pandemic, the impacts of climate change continue to be clear and increasing. While fires are burning in California, intense flooding has damaged homes and destroyed livelihoods in Sudan, India, Yemen, Bangladesh, and many more other locations. Climate change Adaptation is as important as it has ever been. The urgency and ambition needed to fully prepare for the future must continue to increase if we are to protect ourselves and our communities. To, to do this, it is crucially important that opportunities for grassroots 
community-based organizations, non-government organizations of all kinds, local and national governments, researchers and development partners to come together, learn, share innovation and expertise remain available. These moments are central in building the community of practice, networks and know-how that are necessary to develop complex responses to a complex challenge. They ensure that development partners and international organizations can remain grounded, able to learn from those who are most vulnerable by providing opportunities for them to listen to local solutions and wisdom. Adaptation to climate change cannot be successful unless it builds on the knowledge and understanding of the people who are most affected by climate risks. CBA 14 is also an essential resource and learning opportunity for the LDCs. Last year at CBA 13, the Talanaya we held on the Least Developed Countries Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, Life AR, directly informed the Life AR Compact that has been signed by over 10 countries. The Compact sets out a vision for a climate resilient future for all LDCs by 2050 and commits to increasing the flow of climate finance to the local level to 70% of the total. CBA's five themes are of central importance to the future of adaptation and resilience and to informing the next stages of Life ER and other initiatives. The climate finance theme will explore how we scale up the flow of finance to the local level. The responsive policy team will explore the role of social movements in driving change and the adaptation technology team will discuss how new technologies can go beyond innovative projects and become part of national policies. We recognize that addressing poverty, biodiversity loss and climate change are issues that cannot be taken separately but must be addressed together. So I'm pleased to see the addition of a theme on nature-based solutions. Finally, the youth inclusion theme, led entirely by young people, will explore the barriers to the participation of young people in shaping climate policies. We must use these moments to understand the challenges that we can scale up climate finance to the level necessary, scale up technology, or nature-based solutions through policy that is inclusive and builds resilience, prosperous societies. We must continue to build ambition on top of previous commitments under the Paris Agreement so that COP26 in 2021, we will be able to secure an agreement that safeguards a resilient future for LDCs. I thank you. Are, are we ready to start the main panel? Sheila Patel, <laughs> who is the co-founder of Slum Dwellers International, the director um, uh, of Spark India, and also a commissioner on the Global Commission on Adaptation and a champion of the locally led adaptation track. We have Muhammad Musa, who's the executive director of BRAC International, also a commissioner of the Global Commission on Adaptation and one of the champions of the locally led action track. And we have Rosemary Atiano, who's the Chief Executive Officer and the founder of Community Mobilization for Positive Empowerment Campaign. Welcome, Sheila, Musa, and Rosemary. Um, Rosemary, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to start with you. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing on the ground in the communities that you work with um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic crisis, climate crisis, all these crises are coming together. What are some of the challenges you hear from communities, and what are some of the innovations you're seeing in response to those challenges? You have to unmute, Rosemary. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to join the CBA 14. Uh, it's my first time joining such a uh, conference. I'm very delighted to be here. And uh, I would start by saying that uh, during this pandemic, the government of Kenya, as in most countries, 
with advice from the World Health Organization, has uh, been uh, forced to put in a few measures and restrictions. Restrictions such as uh, social distancing, restrictions like having uh, masks, having to put on uh, masks when you're going for gatherings, banning on public gatherings. And you realize that this, coupled with the erratic changes in climate, has changed a lot of things for us. Realizing that women are the core people in the farming sector in the developing countries, this has really had a lot of impact on them. Uh, in times of crisis such as the COVID-19, resources start becoming strained, institutional capacities also become limited, women and girls face disproportionate impacts that are more pronounced in circumstances of fragility and emergencies. Responding to the pandemic is not about just rectifying long-standing inequalities, but also about building resilient world in the interest of everyone with women at the center of everything. You realize that women are the heaviest burden bearers, yet they are the least producers in the affecting of the climate. However, we can achieve this when we identify several challenges. Some of the challenges that I have uh, identified in Kenya, during this pandemic, you realize there was the lockdown and families had to stay home. An increase in gender-based violence has been realized in the country. Women have to work extra hard. Child labor is becoming a norm, which is affecting us on the ground as women and children. Uh, men have to stay home now, and when they stay home, the women have to really try and uh, look for food and all that. In event of not getting food, you realize that there's a lot of commotion within the house, and uh, gender-based violence is getting on the increase. Another challenge that we are realizing is that people are losing their livelihoods. Millions of people have lost their jobs, and people have to rush back to the community where they came from to try and make up for the loss of economy. So when the economy is lost, then it means there is no household income. And uh, it means that our women have to really struggle hard in terms of food security. And given that the climate is also changing, the food situation in the household becomes a major challenge. We also realized that with the lockdown, our schools were closed and most of our students had to be at home. So the burden of feeding children has also gone higher with the kind of uh, challenges that we are facing. One of the key challenges that is destroying food security is you realize in Kenya there has been floods and uh, the floods have really affected our families. People have lost their homes. People have lost their livelihoods. Farms have been flooded as the lake is reclaiming its position. That's uh, destroying the environment. Uh, the lockdowns have also consequently contributed to temporary cessation and women who run small businesses are actually losing their business because they, for example, in the Maasai community in Kenya, they survive on selling beads. And because there is lockdown and they cannot meet, then it means that the, their livelihoods are already destroyed and the small businesses cannot run. We have also seen the demand for washing hands. We have to wash our hands using clean water. And uh, in the country so far, we have not had a good access to uh, safe, clean water. So we're also struggling with the fact that we need to look for safe water and provide water for hand washing and uh, curb the spread of the virus. So this is also a key challenge to our, our women. Uh, it has also increased the pressure of child marriages. You realize that when the students are at home, like uh, in the pastoralist communities, uh, livestock is a symbol of uh, status, so they are losing cattle and uh, they have to compel their, their young daughters to get their hands in marriage so that they can get more cattle to come in whilst the cattle are dying because of the floods and the erratic effects of climate change. Last, seg another issue is that most African women depend on rain-fed livelihood systems like farming and livestock production. Therefore, any shift in climate patterns has a significant impact on the women and any change in the situation like what COVID has brought around makes it very difficult for our women. So these are some of the 
very few pronounced uh, challenges that we are seeing on the ground. Now, what are communities doing to come up with solutions that are locally based? We must realize that indigenous knowledge is a very key factor in combating climate change. And it is important that in anything that we do, we try and hear the voices of the grassroots communities. So some of the, the, the actions that are innovative actions that are being taken are things like having community dialogues with communities, talking with them to hear what they have to say, hear what they understand with climate change, and trying to fit it in with the scientific version of climate change so that we are able to integrate both systems, the indigenous and the current, so that we are able to respond effectively to climate change. Um, there are, uh, some of our communities also are trying to have adaptations to measures that use very little water so that we use scarce resources. For example, in food production, we are encouraging vertical kitchen gardens or biointensive farming that uh, use very little water yet can produce enough food for our communities. We are trying to encourage our communities to harvest water in every best possible way that they can get clean water and be able to use it to combat the pandemic and at the same time produce food. We are also trying to uh, help our communities adapt to the flood situation. You realize when there are floods, the only way that the government can be able to help these families is to bring them to higher grounds. But the floods have been here with us for years. So is there something that can be done so that we get rid of the floods? I believe there's something that can be done if we have good policies which listen to our local communities because they are the first affected when the floods come. So if we involve them in things that they understand, I want to believe that our communities will be able to respond to the flood situation and the issue of floods could be something in history. Um, we are also trying seeing women and communities coming us up with forestry practices. We are encouraging our communities to plant trees and uh, by helping them plant trees, we're helping them to establish nurseries of indigenous trees that they can easily take care of and be able to plant them in their fields to be able to start uh, mitigating the impacts of climate change. We are also trying to see how we can do advocacy so that policies that are made at the government level are policies that resonate with what communities are thinking about. It is important that we listen to the voices of the community because they also have ideas. Remember, they have been in existence for many years and they had ways of studying the climate. They had ways of, of uh, responding to it. So it's important that even as we get the information from the, the meteorological department, it's important that we also look at the indigenous knowledge and integrate these things so that we are able to work with the communities as a team. We need to do strong advocacy. I see civil society organizations, even us at our organization, we want to involve the community in the push for better policies and implementation of policies. A good policy is like uh, the government of Kenya in May launched the Greening Kenya uh, initiative. Do we involve our communities in the Greening Kenya initiative? Let us not keep it at the national level. Let us bring it to the ground where we have the people who are affected. Get them to understand what it means to green the economy and involve them in greening the economy. As we involve them in greening the economy, I want to believe we are going to start on the right footing because they will be involved. They are the ones who are most affected. They will do it because they understand it. This is going to encourage ownership, it's going to encourage sustainability, and it's going to encourage replication. We do not want policies that stick at the top level of the government, yet is not being rolled down to the ground. So we must encourage our, our communities to develop a voice that can be had. And we are doing this in Compe through what we are calling community conversations. These are simple community dialogues that help communities to identify a problem, be able to gather data about that problem, come up with local-led solutions, then mobilize their local resources before they wait for other resources to come on the ground. So as other resources trickle down, they are already starting the process. And by the time the resources are coming here, 
they are able to fit it into where it really requires to be fitted and they are avoiding issues of replication of and duplication of resources by civil society organizations. We have seen this create a great impact in our communities as the people understand what they're doing and they understand what they really need to do. And we want them to be, build voices that can be heard and heard by the authorities. And we are not leaving women behind because they are the center of this. Finally, uh, I would like to say that it is important that our governments introduce climate change in mainstream education because the young understand these things better than the old. They understand the sciences of climate change. They understand the sciences that are involved in uh, mitigating climate change. So if we begin early with them and start instilling this in them, I want to believe they are going to be very good ambassadors for climate change and will be able to help their parents also at home to be able to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Uh, I want to say, Thank you. They're better in understanding the science, so let us use them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for that uh, incredibly um, you know, insightful and concrete um, reflections on, on what's happening on the ground, on, the, on, on, on how the impacts of the pandemic, the economic crisis, the climate crisis are deeply gendered, very different impacts on men and women, and we need to understand that, yeah. but also that very concrete reflection on the importance of indigenous knowledge, some of the innovations that you're experimenting with on the ground, but also the importance to engage at the policy level and in education. So incredibly useful. Sheila, I'd like to turn to you. Um, a fairly similar question. You're working you know, a little bit more in, in the urban environment in India, in South Asia, in Africa. Some of the challenges that you see, some of the innovations that excite you the most. First of all, Manish, you presented us the, the global picture with, you know, millions and, you know, it's the typical the way by which the World Bank and international organizations talk in this broad brush way. And then Rosemary took us right down to the granular. And I think that is the magic of uh, what all of us have to do is to bring the global and the broad brush to the local and the granular. And I think the biggest challenge that we face in the CBA is where do these two meet or do they don't meet at all? Uh, this is the third CBA that I'm attending and it's strange to be looking at my own face on the screen because I'm usually much more comfortable looking into the faces of people who are listening to me to get a sense of what's clicking and not clicking. So this is strange, but these are COVID times and we are learning new tricks. One of the biggest challenges I feel that all of us who are working as local activists and have now explored the amazing opportunity of aggregating globally as we have as Shack Dwellers International is that gradually we are being represented in different global institutional decision making. And so my role in the uh, Global Commission for Adaptation has actually been to bring in the power of social movements and to bring their voices and their challenges into the climate space where none of them felt that they were a part of. I mean, except for indigenous groups and some communities, most of us felt we were operating in different spheres. And only this adaptation space has actually shown us that the challenges and the problems and the seemingly unescapable vulnerabilities that communities face both urban, rural, uh, in all forms, in all forms of vulnerability, uh, are deeply, deeply connected to climate. And therefore, I think our biggest challenge is that you have all these so many different global targets, mainly the SDGs and climate change. We have to stop looking at them one at a time because many things that we do can be attributed to serve many ends. 
And so one of the challenges I feel we all at CBA have to do is that when people talk about monitoring and assessments and attributions, those of us who specialize in monitoring have to look at ways by which these kind of attributions are considered acceptable and mainstreamed. The other major challenge that we as STI have faced is that whatever Rosemary said, we are facing in the 500 plus cities that we are working in. Our governments are not yet equipped, our cities are not yet equipped to address the huge, huge challenges that the urban and rural poor are facing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, food security, health and comorbidity challenges, the problems of being locked into small and difficult spaces, the absence of digitalization that gives some of us the kind of space to communicate, and the huge uncertainties by which we are all looking at the future. We all started with COVID as if it was a two, three month crisis that we would go back to normal. And we both, we all realized that that's not the case. And therefore, a very important part of what all of us are trying to do in SDI are to look at ways by which we first of all pronounce and demand acknowledgement of sustainably mobilized grassroots networks that begin to sh share their representation both locally, nationally, and globally, and to seek the space that Rosebery spoke so eloquently about in all those spaces so that we are part of creating the solutions and not constantly treated as beneficiaries, consumers, targets, you know, as if we are inanimate objects on which things are going to be thrown at. So this transformation is very important. And a part of what I hope we do in CBA is to create these new partnerships that amplify these voices, which we have on the ground, powerful, strong, deeply committed voices of community representatives from aggregated networks that work with other institutional arrangements that have been more conventionally in the CBA to invade these hallowed spaces of decision-making, of finance allocations, to say, work with us. Don't throw things at us. Don't pretend that the money that you have put aside is actually going to reach us. Or give excuses of why it can't reach us because of this, that, and the other. And therefore, I think a very important challenge in the CBA is how do we construct these negotiations and dialogues with not only our duty bearers, but also with people who are destroying our forests, uh, creating huge carbon footprints, doing all the things that through nature-based solutions and other forms of adaptation, we are all struggling in our own way to bring changes. The other thing which I get constantly in our group discussions within SDI is that the aid architecture is not equipped to deal with these kind of crises. All the support that is seemingly set out to assist grassroots groups to address presently COVID and probably later climate change is so structured that it has nothing to do with the kinds of challenges and problems that people face. And therefore, this hit and miss process has to change. How do we create those conversations? How do we produce these kinds of negotiations? How do we explore spaces where we are in direct confrontation with many others because we think we are on the opposite ends. We have to coexist on this planet. And how do we do that? Many of us are struggling with that. We don't have the answer and we need to know that. 
One of the most amazing things that the Global Commission has helped me articulate is the power of social movements across all the different uh, aspects. I operate in cities, but there are farmers, there are people uh, working on oceans, there are people working on indigenous uh, groups trying to protect their tribal traditions and share their knowledge with the world, all of whom are huge numbers, but remain below the radar, so to speak, in this process. And so one of our challenges, I think, within the local action track and which we want to share with the CBA groups is how do we showcase these in ways that are powerful and sustainable? And finally, one of the biggest challenges that the COVID crisis has shown us is the huge migration. I know in India, we saw this, I think more than anywhere else, but every country has seen a lot of urban migrants who came to work in cities or whose families had just begun to settle in cities, desperately migrate back to their kinship groups in rural areas. And what we found while we were exploring their challenges is that their identity has no portability. First of all, they don't have identity in cities. And then those who do have identities, they are locked in a particular geography beyond which they can get no entitlements. So, we know that climate change is going to produce so many shocks that it is going to produce a lot of migration before the resilience options kick in. And therefore, a very important element that we all have to acknowledge is how do we deal with this? There is no data, there is some data about international migration, but there's not much uh, knowledge and not much documentation or statistical analysis of these urban rural transitions. And therefore, one of the new parts of the architecture we have to develop is to look at the urban and rural geographies as a continuum in which people's movements will continue all the time. The world has taught us not only silos, but it has separated the urban and the rural. I'm one of those people who are saying, we need to do much more work on urban issues and adaptation than CBA has used before. But now I'm coming to a point where we're saying that these two geographies have to be seen on a continuum. And we have to look at all the movements that people will have to continue to make in order to survive climate challenges or pandemics or immediate destruction of their lives and livelihoods before the kind of overall resilience that we are all looking for will be taken up. Right. The final point that I want to make before which I will close is that this CBA has brought all like-minded people together. It's also taught us how to operate on a digital platform. And I hope all of us who are organizers We'll work on this through the year so that by the time we go to different uh, other climate programs, uh, we will take with us the issues that we raise and try and negotiate, bring change, produce transformation that we can report in that. And so we don't come to the next CBA again talking about similar challenges that we speak today. So I wish you all a terrific, terrific week. And I'm already in conversations with many of you. So thank you. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Um, so, many, so many important insights, um, the challenge of migration and the rural urban, um, the need to move beyond the rural urban divide, the challenge of the aid architecture, the current aid architecture system is broken. But perhaps most importantly, I love the, you know, work with us, don't throw things at us um, approach, um, because I think that does capture kind of the essence of the challenge here, is how do we actually um, bring 
um, shifts genuinely beyond the rhetoric, but genuinely from a notion of beneficiaries to empowered partners. Um, I think the rhetoric may have changed, but the reality hasn't. And how do we do that? And are there, where are the entry points to do that in the coming year, I think is a very important question for all of us. Um, Musa, I want to turn to you. You've, um, you've been uh, working to support local communities and institutions since the inception of BRAC and, and even before that. What have you learned about some of the best ways to unlock local capabilities to confront more complex crises? Uh, thank you, Manish, and uh, thanks um, all of my fellow uh, panelists and friends who joined in this uh, CBA opening forum today. Uh, it's an honor um, uh, that I could be present here, even from distance, um, and, and can share my own learning and feelings about this um, whole event. Um, I want to start also by thanking the organizers um, of this forum for uh, making this great event happen at a time when all of us are occupied with this pandemic, which has been affecting everybody's life throughout the planet in one form or another. And to some extent, uh, focus, uh, refocusing attention in a way that social distancing and other public health measures are almost taking us away from each other in many ways. So it's time to really come together again and say, while we are for science, but we are also as human beings and as societies, we are together. And so it's a great forum to begin with and remind us that whole issue. Now, going back to your question, I would not repeat some of the great uh, comment that uh, both Rosemary and, and Sheila has mentioned. Um, I think they covered a large part of it. And since you have uh, asked me to focus the learning of BRAC and a little bit personal, let me highlight a few points without repeating that might be helpful. And I begin with the last point that Manish, you were mentioning um, uh, as summarizing Sheila Patel's point that how do we really make sure that these uh, communities where the main power and energy remain, how do we really work with them as partners as opposed to consider, continue to consider them as beneficiaries and count them as targets? Um, one of the things we learned as BRAC that genuinely believe in the power of the knowledge that those communities have. Believe and feel that the power of the leadership that they can provide and they do provide uh, with, with or without our knowledge in changing their society and managing their lives. Acknowledge that and respect that. And ability to do that require a special mindset, require a special approaches, and require to be humble and really go and sit with them and learn from them. And that's where I think the beginning can happen. The moment we recognize that yes, it is not the communities who are our beneficiaries, rather it's the communities who can help us learn from them. Teach us what are the strengths that human communities can bring to address issues which is diverse from communities to communities, not uniform, not one thing that fits across, then our learning ability and learning agility to go and sit with communities would be a critical, critical power that we can use in order to begin this journey. In this regard, I would like to mention that sometimes we often focus on this whole issue of knowledge that you see on the surface. Rosemary Appa and both uh, Sheila Appa mentioned about the indigenous knowledge that people have. But the amount of tacit knowledge that people have, that would not be expressed unless you really gain confidence of those people, unless you build trust of the people with whom you work, unless you really go and be, give them the confidence that yes, you are here to learn from them genuinely and figure out a way how the knowledge of multiple communities can create a higher value. Unless we do that, then tacit knowledge would remain tacit. So one of the learning from BRAC has been 
to facilitate bringing out tacit knowledge from the communities and help communities to consolidate those and consolidate those, those knowledges from multiple communities. So you literally build a coalition of knowledge bearers and create help create higher value. And that is where we think one of the role we can play. At this time, when we are struggling and we ourselves are connected by technology, as Black, we have been finding you can use technology, even simple technology, to tap to this indigenous knowledge, to tap to this tacit knowledge and interconnect knowledge. As Black, we work not only in Bangladesh, we work in 12 different countries in Asia and Africa directly, but also through our partners in around another dozens of countries where we don't have our physical country office, but we are connected. We have been testing during this COVID-19 time, which we try to take as an also, not only a, a, an issue of, to suffer from, but also an opportunity to really rebuild. We have been testing some mobile-based technologies, some distant methodologies, by which you can tap local knowledges. We can interconnect knowledges, and technology can be a knowledge tapping mechanism, knowledge coalition building mechanism to really create that tacit knowledge come into higher level of value creating power. So I would say that is one of the thing I would definitely share. Second knowledge I'll share that we learned is that issue related to collectivization. When it comes to empowerment, facilitating empowerment of local communities, who do have power, but in many cases latent, hidden. How do we really help take that out? And we, one thing we learned as global community, all of us here will recognize, has been collectivization. We do know that, that that has been one of the approaches, development communities we have used throughout the last 40, 50 years, that collect, help collectivize, bring people together, so that when they're in collective, that the inner power comes out and collective power is the biggest power in promoting social development. We must use that philosophy. But during this COVID-19 time, we realized and learned, and we have been learning even earlier, that you may not be able to collective, bring people in collective all the time. So are there alternative ways of still promoting collectives when you are maintaining this social distancing, when you are supposed to make sure that people are still safe. And we have presently discovered it is possible. Ask local communities that how that can be done. How can local collectivization still be done while ensuring the, so, uh, the safety, security, and the social distancing can be maintained? And we are pleasantly surprised how local communities came up with ideas. Of they themselves come up with ideas sitting at distances, yet connecting with each other. They themselves came up with connecting through, uh, through local leaders and, uh, and, and use local leaders to really get things done in a way which is safer, but you still promote collectivization. And we have been learning that can be done. This is not different only in COVID time. We have been finding even in pre-COVID period, when, for example, we are more and more realizing that in 1970s, 1980s, when we were bringing women groups, women into groups and saying, okay, let them speak with each other, each other and create their collective leadership. That situation was there when many of the women were more focused on households in communities, especially in Asia and some part of Africa we have seen. We are watching over time that as women are getting involved in more and more small businesses and other activities, their time to come to collectives in any way were constrained. So this COVID was just uncutting, uh, curtaining this whole issue that it's not easy to come to collectives or uh, do collectivization. But also we are finding out that you need to figure out alternative ways of really bringing people into collective so that Collective power can still be there in order to really maximize communities' ability 
to lead local changes. As we talk about community-based adaptation, where locally-led approach is the key, where nature-based solutions come from these locally-based solutions, then we see that we have to really look for alternative ways of doing it. And it's not just technology. It's also community's own guidance can help learn about how to go for it. Quickly, a few other things we had mentioned. We have been learning center, however you define center, has a special role in facilitating local community-based leadership. But often, that special role of center is mis mis misunderstood. Sometimes center plays a role which causes more harm than good. And here I'll go back to the phrase, do no harm. Sometimes center feels that we have the responsibility to come with solution. We have been seeing that in this lockdown time. The way lockdown was imposed as if we forgotten that there is a principle of community-based leadership in the world for the last 40 years. The lockdown was critical, but it came as an imposed from top. But that was not the approach which is the most effective one. It works to some extent, but you see how people then go out of home despite the fact that they were at risk. What is most important, that center's role is to more listen, to facilitate, to support, and really figure out how people can gain confidence as opposed to impose, as opposed to implant solution. Figuring out this center's role, which is more empowering rather than disempowering, is a critical role that we need to be master of. Today, here we are talking about a, uh, talking in a group who could be considered as part of centers, although many of us of us have grounding in our ground, but how do we make sure that the central role is empowering rather than causing harm? And that is something we learned as BRAC, that we need to continually master, continually champion, get better at, so that we can really promote this solution. One other, in this solution I would mention, there are tools, there are models, there are methodologies and in existence, and there are innovative approaches. In BRAC, we have tried various innovation. It's an ongoing learning. Innovation is about ongoing learning. Learn about it, test it, learn from it. You will make mistake, but again, adjust it. And in this one, last point I'd mention, there's no alternative of coalition of learning. That coalition of learners and coalition of learning, may more we become global, that is better because then we can collectively get better in this whole thing. Last issue is what we are watching nowadays with a little bit uncertainty. That in the last 30, 40 years, humanitarian and development sector was quite a lot getting support from global north, financially, as well as also some lab-based knowledge, which are helpful. Vaccines are helpful. Uh, similar tools are helpful. We see now this COVID-19 created a situation where both global north is struggling, global, global south is struggling. In this situation, the whole repolarization happening. How within all this, we continue to promote community-based leadership and community-based adaptation to one of the global challenges which is this climate change challenge, which might, I was worried at that at one time in early, in April, May of this year, that is climate change going to, going to be sidelined because COVID is becoming so big. It's our responsibility to make sure that we bring those together, help see the interface between those two, and bring co local communities in the leadership role, together with the leadership role that rest of the global community can play and we collectively create higher value. I'm really very pleased that I could be here and we could be here. We are part of an eco ecosystem. BRAC alone cannot deal with it. SDI alone cannot deal with it. No organization alone can deal with it. Our problem is bigger, bigger than any of us. Therefore, our collectivization 
at the macro level and micro level and connecting micro and macro where we remain locally grounded yet globally impactful using knowledge and advocacy as the tool would remain our strength if we can play right and it's time to play right thank you very much thank you um thank you musa um that was uh, all all three of you just uh, incredibly kind of inspiring opening remarks as we as we kick off this conference so thank you um so many important themes uh, insights from your time um, indigenous knowledge and tacit knowledge uh, the power of collectivization or collective action um, I, I found in particular your critique of the role of the center and how it should do no harm and rather empower facilitate exactly what this conference needs to focus on and also um, uh, resonates well with an exchange that Fiona and Rosemary have been having on the chat box so incredibly important themes we, we want to now actually open up this conversation uh, to all of you. We have a few Mentimeter questions and I'm going to turn it over to Christina, who's going to explain uh, the, next, the next part of this opening session. Thanks, Christina. Manish. That's right. And for those of you who have been to CBAs before, you'll know that it's, it's an opportunity to sit down together, to chat, to connect, to get a different perspective, get new ideas, get inspired by, by the work that, that others are doing. Um, and so we want to bring as much as possible that that interactive that that recharge that you can get from CBA um, and exchange that you can get from CBA into into this year's conference um, while while being virtual. Um, and so what we want to do is go to Mentimeter and we have a couple of polls. So get on your smartphone or open up another um, window on your browser um, and go to menti.com. It's www.menti.com and enter in the code that you see on the screen there, 5866997. Um, and you'll see uh, a couple of questions there um, that we want to answer. And I'll explain the cartoon really quickly. Um, it, this is part of that um spirit of of having a laugh having a groan having a a giggle um these are cartoons that came out of a session last week on climate red where we discussed some of the proposed principles for locally led action um, these are principles that are being developed co-developed with with all of you uh, and there's a session this thursday to continue that co-development process um, that really grew out of um, the last uh, CBA meeting and discussions with SDI and Fire Commission and Climate Justice Resilience Fund, IAED, ICAD, LUC, BRAC, um, and, and various others. So you can see the, the continuity and the evolution of thought and these cartoons just help bring to light some of the, the challenges um, and tensions that we face. If you can go to the next slide, Please. Um, so the first question, um, building off of the, the, the discussion we were just having about COVID uh, and the climate crisis, is the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis that's come uh, as a result of it, is it going to accelerate or impede locally led action? Um, on the one hand, you can, might say it's bringing more attention to the issue that we need strong local institutions to respond, to, to be there when we need them. And in order to be there when we need them, they need to be strengthened. On the other hand, it, you know, these local institutions there in communities, as we've heard, are dealing with lots of different threats and constraints. Um, so it, the effects might be positive, might be negative. Right now, the poll looks like it's head and head between accelerating or impeding action, a few votes for no effect. We'll let that go a, another minute longer, but it, it looks like the, the, the global sense here is that we don't know whether it will hurt or help local action, uh, that we're, we're torn in our opinions on that. All right, interesting, interesting results. I wanna maybe go to the next slide, to the next question. Now they're dead even, 44, 45. Uh, again, drawing in one of the cartoons there. And the next question um, is open-ended. Um, it's on what are the barriers 
that you think need to be tackled to make the most progress on locally led adaptation action. Um, so this is your opportunity to type something short. Um, you know, we don't have time for master theses here, but um, type in what you think are the key barriers. Trust, interesting. Patriarchy, sexism, interesting. These, these themes have already come up in discussion. Flexible finance, white charity, post-colonial relationships, power, governance, good governance transparency, underestimating local knowledge. That theme certainly came up in the discussions. Funding or lack thereof. Uh, relevance, that's an interesting one. Maybe we're putting forward irrelevant uh, solutions. Power imbalance, trust between the communities. Type in something, even if you've already seen it, um, just to, to emphasize the point. Uh, if we see multiple of, of the same things, the same barriers, that'll, that'll give us information as well. Empowerment, interest and willingness of those with power and money to listen and act. Arrogance of privileged uh, professionalism. Very interesting. CBA is, is living up to its, its reputation of, of saying things how they are and being frank and, and honest. Capitalism, power imbalance, finance, interesting. All right, we'll give that just another second or two. So if you want to, to type in your answer, please do. Um, Top-down mentality, another on finance. That's certainly a theme and, and a theme in this year's CBA. Centers inappropriate role, power, a lot of, lot of common themes here. Understanding, again, finance coming up, Western power, power echoed again. I think I see accountability there, access to funds, great. Technology transfer and finance for feasibility studies. Now, just getting started, having the resources to get started, tribalism, governance, excellent. Great, I think we'll go to the third question, the third and last question, Sam, if you don't mind. And there will be ample opportunities to interact through the chat box, through the Hoopa app. Um, so this is, this is not the only opportunity. So the third question is, is a poll. Um, we want you to vote on what are the top priorities for community of practice on locally led adaptation for the next decade. Where do you think we as a community of practice should be focusing our efforts? What, what should we be doing? Um, and if you, if there's an answer that isn't reflected there, um, feel free to type it into the chat box. Um, so that we, we capture that. Um, uh, there's, oh, now everything is neck and neck, 25% in terms of identifying funding. Oh, now fostering connection between donors, CSOs, and grassroots representatives is, is in the lead. Um, next is developing innovative financing models uh, along close to raising the profile of, of funding for locally led action um and identifying funding and again if you think there's another priority that should be there that should be discussed um please feel free to put that in the, in the chat box because we we want to hear your thoughts and, and don't want to constrict the, the conversation to these four choices so still fostering connections between donors cso's and grassroots representatives is is in the lead there's a lot of desire for that which is great to see. All right. Well, I hope that was useful, and 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 for us, it was a good way to gauge where where people are minds are at, and what the thinking is, and what the issues are, for for further discussion um, throughout the rest of the conference. Um, what I do want to say is, if people have questions for the panelists, we might not have time to get to them during this opening session. But again, feel free to put it in the chat box. The chat box will remain active and um, the panelists will have the ability to go in and provide answers to your questions or continue the discussion there. So, so this is not the, the end of the opportunity to ask questions and, and have a dialogue together. 
Manish, back back to you for a few more questions. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Very, very interesting. Um, we, we wanted to actually see if I could uh, get our panelists to reflect on, on what they saw through the Mentimeter exercise. Um, I was particularly struck by that first question regarding whether the pandemic is, is an opportunity or a risk and kind of an, I, I think the concern is it could be a risk, but, but if leveraged well, perhaps it's an opportunity. But I wonder, um, Rosemary, if maybe we'll go in the same order, Rosemary, Sheila, and Musa. We only have one or two minutes for each of you. So just any quick reflections on the Mentimeter and any quick um, uh, final, um, final insights you'd like to share. But we have about six minutes for the three of you because I would like to give five, seven minutes to Salim to help provide some closing remarks. Um, Sheila? I'm sorry, Rosemary. Rosemary, would you like to? Uh, sorry, Rosemary. Thank you. Um, I think uh, looking at uh, what has been uh, shown on the screen, uh, in my take, I think uh, in terms of the economic crisis, uh, we are not really sure which direction it will go. But I think the direction it goes depends on how we handle everything. Okay, sorry. Okay. I think uh, in terms of the economic crisis, it will go either way, depending on how we, well we handle the situation. Because if we put in proper measures and empower our communities well, then it may not really affect the economy so much. But if we do not respond in the right way, then we may be headed for a crisis. Because remember I said earlier that uh, many of us have lost livelihoods. In Kenya, millions of people have lost their jobs, meaning that the economy is already affected. But if we come in with measures that can bring back the livelihoods of our people, come back with measures that can be easily implemented, then we may not affect the economy so much. I'm looking at a grassroots community where we have lost livelihoods because of the floods and uh, the crops are no longer there. And we come in with the measures where we are liberating the woman to be able to get some income or some uh, kind of loaning facility to help the women rebuild their businesses, then we will be rebuilding the economy. At the same time, we will be working on mitigating the impacts of climate change. Uh, I'm looking at uh, a very interesting point that has come out about power and governance. I'm a strong believer that communities have the power. Right. And I'm a strong believer who believes that we should not do things top bottom approach. We should not make our communities feel like they have to beg for services because it is their basic right to have those services. So what we need to do for our communities is to empower them to know the capacities that they have and how they fit into the system. Excellent. Yes, and Thanks. I also believe, I believe that if actors can work well with communities and bring out the power that is in communities. We, we, are, we are not going to start grumbling for resources. We are going to use our resources very well for the benefit of our communities. And I want to emphasize that it is very important that we respect our communities. I'm a community person and I believe in communities being respected. And I want to believe we are, agree with Mohammed more than anything else that communities have the power we just need to bring out the knowledge in them, bring out the potential in them, make them understand what is going on, and communities will always respond in a positive manner. Once they respond in a positive manner, they are going to create voices that can be heard, not just voices, voices that can be heard by the authorities. So that's my quick reflection. Thank you so much, Rosemary, and apologies. I, I just, Sheila, so we have maybe a minute each. I just want to leave Salim with uh, some time <laughs> to provide some closing reflections, but that was really powerful, Rosemary. Thank you, Sheila. Well, I'm happy to give all my time to her. She's so good at it. I believe in all the things that she says, but I am deeply, deeply pessimistic about the present global leadership and the architecture of finance that is managed globally to give any bother, to bother at all with what's happening on the ground. Our governments are behaving very responsibly 
most of the resources even taken for COVID are not coming to poor people. So I, I don't give that equal weightage. I'm deeply, deeply disappointed. And I think we are all going to be left for communities to do their usual survival and uh, to, to keep getting depleted of their energies and their resources because of the indifference of the global institutions and our national institutions obsessed with GDP and nothing else. Sheila, thank you. And, and your, your, um, you know, the, I raised at the very beginning that while we're having this conversation, there's this financing for development conversation happening. And there's almost, and I've been involved in that, and there's no, no real no, none at all. piece around locally led action. So one of the questions, Salim, I'm going to have for you when you, we come to you is your prime minister is going to have an opportunity to speak on the 29th of September uh, at the head of state finance for development summit. Can we make a big plea for rethinking the entire architecture of how finance should be structured in ways that genuinely create partnerships with local communities? So just, just a thought there. Musa? Yeah, no, thank you. I want to start by thanking those who voted in this Mentimeter. It's very rewarding to see how we all are thinking. It's a good sample size. Um, what are some of my tech from this whole Mentimeter polling? Uh, number one, it's becoming very clear that, uh, I, um, that we are not, not sure where the, where, the, uh, where, where the confidence in. This whole, it reaffirms the uncertainty, uh, uncertain world we are in. That's why you see some of us feel that maybe COVID-19 will accelerate local action. Some of us feel maybe it will impede uh, because we are not sure. That uh, puts the onus on us. Which direction would push this whole journey towards? Would we really make sure that we have more optimism or will we will remain silent? It's, it's opposite. We should, it's time for us to act. Two or three other words I will take out from the Mentimeter polling. One was trust. I think building trust at a time when social distancing is remaining away is a public health requirement and a norm. We value that. How do you really build trust within this? This is important. Another point is this whole issue of fostering, need for fostering connections, fostering relationship between different groups, not only between donors, community-based organizations, and grassroots movements, but also with each and every community. And here we have a role to play. If we do that right, then I think we can play this bigger role of turning uncertainty to more certain. I would end by saying, it's our time to really re-emphasize on this locally-led action even more. There's no time better than this when you needed this. And this requires all of us to act together. And let's do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Musa. Um, this is such a rich uh, conversation. Salim, um, who I think needs no introduction in this, uh, in this forum, um, but uh, we really would love to turn to you now um, and offer some, um, some final uh, reflections on this opening session. Uh, Salim, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Manish. Thanks to the wonderful speakers, Rosemary, Sheila, and Musa, one can listen to them for hours, I think, um, and for a very rich discussion. I'm not going to uh, pick up on the conversation that we've had. We will have several days to do that. I'll, I'll just zoom out a little bit in terms of where we are now and how far we've come, uh, recalling that I started this series of CBA conferences 15 years ago in 2005, and we are still continuing. I'm very glad to see that my colleagues in IID are still continuing it since even though I left uh, and now it's up to them. Uh, and the current situation as ha several people have already pointed out is a new normal or an opportunity for a new normal where I think we need to up our game very considerably. Uh, the first way in which I feel that we might think of doing this is the fact that we have now gone online. Uh, this is also, one, on one side, a difficulty because we're not having face-to-face -face discussions, which used to be the key element of our networking events in the past, uh, meeting people. In fact, it was meeting over lunch, dinner, and, and breakfast, which was more important than listening to people in the formal sessions. Uh, and we're missing that. Uh, the second uh, opportunity, though, is that we can now link across the world. And community-based adaptation is not a local 
level issue in developing countries only. It's everywhere. Even in the richest countries, there's a big dichotomy between local communities and their own masters and rulers at the national level. And so we have an opportunity to link up globally across the various grassroots level community actions in the context of climate change adaptation in particular, which is now happening everywhere. The climate change impacts are happening everywhere. Climate change adaptation is a necessity in every single country in the world. Rich or poor doesn't really matter anymore. And that is a really new situation that is an, a new opportunity for us as a global community. So what I would like us to think about is in the, in the very short, the medium and the longer term, the very short term being the next few days, we will hopefully be able to spend time with each other, not just listening to each other, but engaging with each other. And, and uh, my colleagues in IID have come up with various uh, platforms that enable us to do that. I, I really do hope that we can all use this opportunity to engage, talk to each other, uh, build up this community of practice on CBA even bigger than it has been in the past. And so by the time we finish this particular set of meetings over the next four or five days on the five themes that we have, it's not just that we've done some good networking and have some good ideas, but we have a way to take it forward as a community of practice. I really do want us to think deeply about how do we take this community of practice further uh, forward. And then in the, in the medium term, we've already heard about the upcoming uh, a global summit on adaptation, which will take place on the 25th of uh, January. Originally supposed to have been a one day event in Amsterdam in October. It's now because of the COVID-19, uh, 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 still a one day event, but postponed to 25th of January. And it's no longer just one event in Amsterdam, but a series of anchor events around the world. One of which will be here in Dhaka, where I'm speaking from now, where uh, the government of Bangladesh will be hosting one of these anchor events whose very focus will be on locally led adaptation. It will be the global event on locally led adaptation uh, uh, hosted by the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. And to answer your question, Manish, she is very much a champion of this. Just a few days ago, uh, she launched the regional South Asia office of the Global uh, Center on Adaptation here in Dhaka, uh, together with Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, who is the chair of the GCA and uh, uh, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands as well. And so we are hoping that the GCA Center in Dhaka will become one of these leading centers on locally led adaptation. And uh, Prime Minister of Bangladesh is very much committed to having Bangladesh um, be a, a global leader, but also share that knowledge and experience with other countries, particularly South-South uh, countries, and in particular under the leadership of the Global the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is nearly 50 of the most vulnerable countries, which she now chairs for the next two years. So an opportunity for her to lead her, use her leadership position uh, to take that issue forward. And then in the final context of the uh, us, the community of uh, parties of practice on community-based adaptation, locally led adaptation, how do we keep our conversations going, continuing? And in, in fact, I will be hosting just a, prior to the summit, the four days prior to the summit, from the 21st to the 24th of uh, January, the next Gobeshana conference. Gobeshana, for those of you who don't know, is a Bangla word for research. And it's a platform of universities and research institutes that have been working on adaptation in Bangladesh for many years. We do a big annual conference last year, last time, last January, we launched the locally led adaptation uh, track of the Global Commission there. And next year, January 21 to 24, we will have a much more in-depth discussion. So the CBA conference outcomes, we hope to take to Gobeshana in January and continue this conversation. So what I, I want is to not finish when we finish the closing session of CBA, but to continue and find ways to continue this um, dialogue and use the fact that we now all live in a, a Zoom or a uh, internet virtual world to our advantage, to link up across time zones and across geographies in a way that perhaps in the past, we would have to fly to places to be able to do that. Let's no longer fly, but let's keep connected. And so to me, that really is the big challenge. I would like to invite everybody who's listening to this opening event over the next four days to think about it and come up with ways of taking that forward, which I would be very interested in following up 
taking forward into what I call the next 10 year journey to make sure that locally led adaptation plays a very significant part in the global response to climate change where the vulnerable communities are given their due recognition as we've just heard from all the excellent speakers today. What we've, what we've heard is lots of lessons, lots of ways to do it forward. What we haven't seen is those lessons being taken up and learned. So let's hope that we can make that happen over the next 10 years. Thank you. I'll stop there and back to Manish. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Salim, both, both for those uh, remarks that kind of lay out um, the, the days, the weeks, and the months ahead, but, but also for your foresight, uh, Salim, uh, in, in imagining uh, the Community-Based Adaptation Conference and, and, and helping really advance this agenda for decades. So thank you, Salim. And um, everyone, um, want to also thank uh, our, our, our terrific panelists, uh, Rosemary, Sheila, and Musa for such uh, inspiring uh, and challenging um, remarks uh, as we open uh, this week's worth of discussions. Um, I, I just think this, this point about how the, how the current pandemic, the crisis, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, how we, how we change that from a risk to an opportunity, how we challenge and confront the center to really, to really re redefine how we think about economic structures, how we think about societal structures in ways that create genuine empowered partnerships is at the heart of what we must do in the coming, in the coming months ahead. There's a small window to get a outsized change because of how fluid the world is today. Let's take our advantage of it. Let's work together and make the most of it to realize the ambitions of what all of us so care so deeply about. So with that, please join me. I know we can't uh, verbally do it, but a really warm round of applause uh, to, to all of our speakers and to all of you for joining for us. Uh, say it in the chat box, uh, clap visually, um, viscerally, uh, figuratively in whatever way you can. But thank you to everyone. And um, back to someone <laughs> who will tell us what happens next. Thanks, Manish. I'm going to jump in now. Um, my name's Sam Green, I'm with IIED. I'm going to give a few housekeeping announcements and just explain very briefly how you can engage with CBA. Some people will already be experts at this stage, but this is aimed at anybody who is looking at the Hoover platform uh, and feeling particularly confused. So this will only take a, a very short while and aims to give you an opportunity to see what's going on and how you can engage. If you visit the Hoover platform, you'll see this overview page. Now the first port of call, if you're confused about how to do anything, is to visit this how to section. Uh, that's going to give you videos on how to contribute, uh, where you can find more information, and that should be your first port of call. A second port of call is the ask the organizers uh, section in the community boards. There you'll see other guidance, updates, and news. Um, about what's going on in the conference. If you're interested in uh, finding out more about the program, please don't forget to visit the agenda and you must try to sign up. If you visit the chat box on the session that you are interested in, in the agenda, you will see a sign up form. Please use the sign up forms to let us know that you are coming to that session. And if you cannot come to the session that you have signed up for for any reason, please, please let us know so that we can move your place in the session to somebody who's on the waiting list. The community boards are extremely active. There are already over a thousand messages exchanged. And if you don't like what you see, you can start your own community board. If you're having a particularly interesting discussion on a particular topic in the community section, let us know and we can facilitate a meetup. That's a virtual call where you can discuss the topic in more detail. So please do get in touch if you found a niche topic that you would like to have a roundtable discussion on. Finally, in the market and uh, place, you'll find you can interact with participants talking about specific projects and more marketplace tools are being uh, entered all the time and there's also a film competition you can find it in the marketplace and you can vote for the winner in the poll section 
the enter the uh, the participant entering the winning film will get free access to CBA 15 next year. So it's quite the prize. Recordings from sessions and rapporteurs notes will be made available to participants as soon as they're ready. Please do tweet using the hashtag CBA14 from any of your sessions. And if you do have any problems, contact the team at cbaconference at iied.org. I want to thank again all of the presenters and speakers today for really powerful contributions. And we are really very much looking forward to the next few days uh, and the discussions that we're going to have on the platform together. And as Salim has just said, and beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us at this opening plenary. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all over the next few days.